Welcome back to the Infinite Media Podcast and it has been a great week. We came out with Age of Wonders for Dragon Dawn. Not me, but you know, Paradox Interactive came out with it, but we were able to play it and so I feel like I should be a part of the team because Dragon Dawn was an amazing DLC. Probably if I would have looked up more information about it, I wouldn't have been as surprised, but I'm glad I didn't look up the information because they did amazing they came out strong with their first dlc the dragon forms was a great addition to the game an entirely new ruler type so now i'm starting to think what if all the other dlcs are that good now if you haven't played it you should definitely play it the dragon form ruler my only dislike for it is that it's more gold and I would have liked an option for you to choose hey do you want to go the gold route or the magic route because there are dragons that specialize in magic at least in the Dungeon and Dragons Pathfinder universes dragons are magical creatures they uh, have high spell resistance they can cast spells and I would have loved that option because my playthrough I prefer to play with magic which is the only hindrance is like uh, okay I'll still do the wizard king too but I understand they want to make it different and if they would have given that option people would have chosen a dragon ruler with a dragon ruler for magic less over the wizard king but I think they could have changed that now I'm going to first go into the DLC of Age of Wonders 4 and I want to go over it because they, we have some good selections coming up well not Empires of Ashes Empires and Ashes it's I don't think it's gonna be good well not that it's gonna be good it's not gonna be my cup of tea I'm still gonna get it check it out but it's not it's just making me think it's not like they're gonna they're gonna have a new culture new tome empire building options that stuff will probably be good something nice to see but from what i remember playing as the empire or the technological race in age of wonders 3 okay they do get the dreadnought which was pretty cool in age of wonders 3 so playing with the technology would have been cool but nothing like standoffish i'm a magic type person the dragons was just so amazing them breathing fire being super strong it's like it was amazing but then we go into age of wonders 4 primal fury dlc that coming out q1 of 2024 now we're starting to step up going back to magical stuff this is going to be even cooler uh might not be as cool as the dragons i don't know it sounds good you can create races using new beastly forms and a prime evil culture I understand the primeval culture now primeval i don't necessarily know the definition of primeval i'm thinking from all of my watching these fantasy things i'm guessing it's it's like old time i'm thinking nature it's it's a centers around nature but anyway a new tones of magic with the hidden powers of the fey realm i believe a nymph is considered a phase so i'm guessing they might do some type of differences for like uh n different type of nips they might add red caps i'm thinking those little fey creatures at least are fey creatures in the dungeon and dragons universe and then your surroundings contain new forms of wildlife creatures and bountiful resources i haven't seen any dire penguin yet that's probably because i've been playing the story modes but maybe a dire penguin will come up and then the last dlc scheduled i think they're just throwing everything crazy this expansion opens portals to realms filled with arcane marvels and unspeakable horrors i think we already have that new for that's probably a whole new story realm new forces threaten the rule of godir mage haven i'm 
I'm curious about that because the Wizard Kings have already been introduced. So this is probably a step up above the Wizard Kings. Then we have new story content, strange monsters, new racial form. This is interesting. What other races? Maybe they'll add tieflings. I have no idea. Magical realms and locations bring a new dimension to the game. Well, we already had magical realms, but maybe it's a different type of magical realm. And then they add pictures from the Dragon Dawn stuff. That was pretty nice. So I just want to go over that. Eight to one to four Dragon Dawn is probably my most favorite DLC for a video game. Adding to it. Well, I'm probably not the best, but my favorite. My favorite is probably one of the Skyrim DLCs. I'm really looking at Dawn Guard. And when I say my favorite, I'm t comparing it to what it adds to the game and change is the experience because with the Elder Scrolls, the Skyrim DLC, the Dawn Guard added the Vampire Lord. I always play Vampire whenever I play Skyrim and it revamped. It made playing vampires actually viable. So that's why I'm saying Dawn Guard for Skyrim versus Dragonborn where, okay, you go and fight this dragon uh, this other dragonborn you go through the cult of Hermaeus Mora it's more like you get stronger in that DLC but it's not like it doesn't change the gameplay up it re they really didn't do anything new sure you can use dragon aspects sure you can tame dragons but the riding mechanic it's not really it's not like riding a broomstick in hogwarts legacy they might have whoop well, i know in the new elder scrolls 6 you're not going to be a dragonborn but that's perfectly okay dragon dawn did for age of wonders 4 what dawn guard did for skyrim so i look forward to more dlc it's just improving on the games and do doing something new so now we're going to talk about Baldur's gate 3 and then we're no before we get to Battle Gate Three, we are going to. I just want to briefly mention Starfield because Todd Howard has appeared on the show where he's answered some questions. Pretty much, I need to watch it myself, but I just glanced at a video. The main things I took away from it is the companion romancing because I know that's a big thing for individuals because i'm not really like i really don't care if you can rom romance the characters it's not uh it's it's a nice thing to do if i can do it i'll do it in the game but it's like i don't play a game it's like oh let me romance this person i want to play this game i want to romance this person nor do i go through the game saying man i can't romance this person it's so unfortunate blah 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 just take it how it goes but that's the only thing I heard. The other things were similar to what we got from the Starfield Direct. So I just wanted to mention that. Now I want to get to Baldur's Gate 3. Because I've been playing Wrath of the Righteous. And <sighs> playing Wrath of the Righteous. Wrath of the Righteous is amazing. Especially having the mythic stuff. It just adds more to the game. The repurpose spell... I understand why they did it and it, it is useful and it is kind of cool because I was finally able to use it. I used it against Kavara, the dragon. This is right after you get your Lich Mythic rank 3 where you able to battle all these people, blah, 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 you free dress and stuff like that. Then you hear news that a dragon is attacking different units and stuff like that. You need to hire this person to go slay the dragon. Sure. Everything's understandable. I did that one first because, well, technically I did the Vescovore Queen, the Nashant one first. Because, of course, I'm going to do a, not of course, but I plan on doing a what if. So instead of going pure Lich, which I'm going so far, I'll probably do what if Varanel went Swarm That Walks. I like I like what if sagas like the what if sagas for Marvel and all that stuff. I think that's kind of cool. What if 
So yeah, I was able to use repurpose against the dragon. And I found out that apparently the dead things don't follow you outside of that area, which I understand why they did it for power reasons and for just aesthetics reasons, not having all these creatures. Uh, and it could be useful or it could not be useful. It was still useful to me because they don't follow you outside the area. But if you go like if you're in that area and you go into like downstairs or like to a ruins, then they still follow you through it. It's just that area on the map per se, which I'm glad they do it because I know in game that it's considered a different map. Now, if they were restricted by map, that would have been very bad. But at least with this instance, I can repurpose an enemy and then they can fight when I'm going through a dungeon or if I'm trying to free another city, which I can probably or go, go through a dungeon, all this stuff. So that's nice. But I just wanted to mention that because the stories in these games are going to be fun. I'm sure Baldur's Gate 3 is going to be as fun if not more just because of the level of detail that they put into it and it's a Larian Studios game so now you're going to have energy interaction so if you throw a lightning attack and they're standing in water and stuff like that then it will electrocute the water so there I know that original D&D rules don't factor those things in there but they're adding it they're making it more realistic and then when i look at these mm -hmm. characters i am excited we're gonna go through these characters i like the visuals on their website amazing collector's edition when i looked at it i was thinking i don't get collector's editions but if I were to get a collector's edition, it would be nice. One of these things is Magic the Gathering. I had my little addiction to ma uh, Magic the Gathering at one point in my life. But now I no longer have it. I'm a, I get addicted to card games like Yu-Gi-Oh! Magic the Gathering. But they cost too much money. And I don't. The Magic the Gathering is worse. Because I found out. That apparently every time they come out with a new set, the old sets, but not they don't become obsolete. They have different game modes where you can play historic, where you can use any set from the past. But when it comes to tournament play and stuff like that, you have to use the newer sets within the certain time frame, which essentially makes the older cards obsolete. Now, the reason I don't like it is because I loved the War of the Spark set so much, and then eventually it just timed out. So it was like, oh, now I can't play it in tournament. And I love the War of the Spark. I read both War of the Spark books, War of the Spark, Ravnica, and I think, I don't know the name of the last one, because it's War of the Spark, and then there's a last subtitle to it but either way i read them both and it was a nice culmination to the story and then it finally put all of uh nico bolas plots together i haven't read the previous magic the diagram books i found quite a few of them on ibooks so i could read them in the future whenever i get time we'll see what happens i have a lot of things to work on but that's enough of this oh and oversized metal d20 sure if you want to play i do like the character sheets if i had a group with me currently i would play fifth edition but right now i don't so I'm not gonna play fifth edition and i'm working on my own game rule set of course it's gonna be based off of the D D. Not D and D. I can't say that copyright reasons. Don't sue me. It's gonna be based on the open game license, which technically is D and D D and three three point five. They 
release that as an open game license, but it's going to be based on that because, hey, it's, from what I understand, the most popular system, and it's the one that I love the most. Uh, I like how D&D 5th Edition, I don't like that they simplified it too much. And Pathfinder 2nd Edition, they went towards a route that I wasn't kind of feeling like the three action thing. Uh, I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling it. It's nice. I have the books. I'll play it. But before I was like, I'll play Pathfinder 2nd Edition before I play original Pathfinder. But then I was in a situation where the group wanted to play Pathfinder over Pathfinder 2nd Edition. So then after I played Pathfinder over and over and over and over again, and it has the mythic book and well technically star finder is it's a whole another rule system but it's based on the pathfinder rules so we're not gonna get into that rule set right now but it's just so much more fun well i'm gonna say so much more fun because you can have fun within the pathfinder second edition system especially if you have a good party of friends to play with interactions like that but it's just more fleshed out and you really have more choice pathfinder second edition gives you a lot of choice compared to fifth edition what well, when it first came out i know fifth edition is coming out with some other stuff but they could do they could do it better i know pathfinder some party some characters and stuff like that their strengths the way how for example the fighters start off strong and the spellcasters start off weak because spellcasters uh level one spells really really not that good but then they grow stronger because the magic just becomes so strong a level five wizard could take out probably a level two three party with one fireball I'm just saying. But that's the thing about magic. So it's kind of that balance. Like how do you. And then it really depends on the situation too. It's all about compatibility. And stuff like that. How you set it up. Which is what I'm going to lean towards that. The realism. Over the more video game aspects. Because in a certain situation. If you uh, put a level 5 fighter. Versus a level five wizard and the fighters in heavy armor and you're just standing them toe to toe in a arena type combat situation is like why the wizard might win it depends on initiative is it if the fighters in heavy armor they're probably not going to move as fast and stuff like that. it depends on the feats i don't know if there's a feat that reduces the movement penalty for a fighter or anything like that but the wizard could just get off a fireball move get off a fireball i know the fighter can charge which can do that too but then the wizard can five foot step get off a fireball and the fighter dies if he doesn't have the right feats but if you're like in a situation and you have a rogue and the rogue is targeting this wizard and the wizard doesn't know this rogue is targeting the rogue can sneak up on the wizard and kill him it all depends on compatibility and situations and that teaches players who are actually into the game and the role playing experience and don't treat it as a regular video game they understand to play the game like that play it as if you lived in the world instead of playing it as a video game and then you'll start to explore options that's the thing and the way how you approach role playing games especially tabletop role playing games because tabletop role playing games give you the freedom that's why you have the dm the dm is the arbiter of the rules the god of the world they determine how the world reacts to your uh well to your actions but i was going to talk about video games and how <laughs> i was going to say how ai I just say, say it all right well i think talk about how ai i know that 
there were certain things like Sword Coast Legends. I had so much hope for that game, but then the servers went down. They stopped supporting it. I don't know why. It was supposed to be based off of the fifth edition rule set where you have it's like a 4v1 thing where you have the game master, the dungeon master, they create these maps and stuff like that. And the players create their characters, they go through it. Kind of like um there's another game i don't know if it's a michael meyer game or anything like that where there was a 41 one player plays as michael the other players try to survive i think evolve is another good example if you understand the 4v1 i like the 4v1 format uh, for person team i like being on that if you have people to play with playing with random strangers eh, it's not going to hit the same but if you're the monster, it's always fun playing the monster. So I had hope for that. I still need to try out Celasta because Celasta gives you the opportunity to create a map, which might be interesting. We'll see. But and now Celasta, I might make four totally new characters because I cannot. They, they do have a tiefling, but I want a paladin. I don't have to have a dragonborn paladin. I'm just thinking because I need a four person team. So I'll probably do so last the crown of the magister and I'll pro because you can make four separate characters. However you want them. I can do Varanel. He's a sorcerer. Seraphina is a sorcerer as well. And then Erlis. We'll see. We'll see. Instead of creating four new and plus I have the pictures. Uh, so I was just thinking, I think way too much. And now I'm just rambling, but that's good. That's good because we're talking about video games. Let's talk about these game characters. Now, I'm not sure if, well, we'll get to them. I'm not sure if him specifically is a companion who can join your party because he's a vampire. Well, it says a vampire spawn. Asterion, proud the knight as a vampire spawn for centuries, serving a sadistic master until he was snatched away. Now he can walk in the light and has the chance of a new life. But how long can he keep his past buried? When they say walk in the light, can he, like... I know vampires don't just die, like, instantly. I believe, I think they still take damage from being... I haven't fought any vampires, like, in D&D 5th edition or Pathfinder. It's like the DMs I play, they, they, they just don't use vampires. Plus, I know it depends on the campaign and stuff like that if you're going to come across vampires. And the core rule book, not the core rule book, but the master manuals or, or the bestiary, depending on if you're thinking D&D &D or Pathfinder, respectively. There are a lot of monsters, so you can have fun. Uh, I like how Pathfinder has templates, which I want to take that approach because, from what I understand, Fifth Edition doesn't have templates for their monsters. But I do ha like how Fifth Edition added legendary actions to monsters. I do like that. We need to keep that. I'm just trying to take because I. Every time I play these systems, I've never found one that I just liked completely without any problems. But hopefully we can get to that point. But yeah, for this person, Vampire Spawn, is he, can we play as him? And when I say play as him, can he be a companion? That's what I want to know. Then we have the Wizard Prodigy. Gale is a wizard prodigy whose love for a god has made him attempt a dread feat no mortal should. Blighted by the forbidden magic of ancient Nethrith. Gale strives to undo the corruption that is overtaking him and win back his goddess's favor before he becomes a destroyer of war. What? Is Nethril uh, an evil god or something? Hmm, hmm, hmm. And the wizards and finding forbidden knowledge and stuff like that, they need to fix that. And when I say they need to fix that, I'm, I mean the wizards, not the people who created Baldur's Gate video game. It's like wizards, they're always trying to find forbidden information. I know she is a companion, and I did not know she was a warlock. She probably has packed the blade. Which is okay. 
because you have the pack, the first three in the from the player's handbook. You have the pack of the blade, pack of the chain, which lets you get a familiar and stuff like that, and pack of the you got the blade, the chain, and the tome, or it might be called the pack of the book. I think it's called pack of the tome though. Uh, pack of the tome just gives you more spell slots, get, lets you get some rituals and stuff like that, uh, similar to like a wizard. It's, it's basically like a wizard spell book. Uh, when I was first thinking, I was like, oh man, will, we, she, will, will she automatically be packed of the blade? Because I want her to have agonizing blast. And then I realized all warlocks get agonizing blast, so it doesn't matter. Uh, agonizing blast is like so good. Oh, because Eldritch Blast is the cantrip. So in 5th edition, over and the, one of the things I love that they did with 5th edition is with the cantrips, the cantrips go stronger with your spellcaster. So that's why it just, so it helps them justify lowering the amount of spell slots, which I'm okay with lowering the amount of spell slot because you can get a lot of spell slots. Well, base Pathfinder, you get a decent number of spell slots. With the mythic stuff, you get a lot of spell slots. When you play the video game, especially in uh, Wrath of the Righteous, since I'm playing on core and I've been playing on core this entire time, and you have the core, the normal amount of enemies you can fight, um, I'm like, okay, this is what happens when you have a design team actually design maps send creatures in it's like battles are tough we're starting to re do resources dungeons or the situation i'm in for example when i'm playing a tabletop uh with a regular dm they don't put as many enemies they don't put as many encounters like towards the end we are weak and battered broken and bruised they either have these like super strong monsters uh I won't say that. Probably that's an experienced DM. They'll throw a monster that your party can't compete and they just get wrecked. But I like the attention that the DMs put into creating creatures. Uh, and I probably want to eliminate the buff rounds. I love talking about this and using this as a backdrop because now I can flesh out my ideas. And you guys can let me know what do y'all think? If y'all were able to design a system, what type of system would you design or what system would you improve on because i understand there are mods and i'm pretty sure before people were modding video games they were modding tabletop rpgs it's called homebrew but it's just making things better the rule of cool if yeah i understand that change up the rules as long as it's cool but yeah, I'm so glad um, back uh, I went off on a tangent. Eldritch Blast, all warlocks get it. So the difference with cantrips, for example, I'll use Ray of Nah, not real far. I know Firebolt. Uh, you have an equivalent to Firebolt. I really don't know the name. It might still be called Firebolt in Pathfinder, but in Pathfinder, it's only going to do one d three damage. Just same thing as Ray of Frost is only doing one d three damage. When you start off in fifth edition, your Cantrip Firebolt is doing one d ten damage. I think it has a range of sixty feet. So it gives you something to use. Now, that increases to 2d10 damage when you reach 5th level. So about the same time that the fighter is getting their next attack. So when the fighter can attack 2 times with their action, the spellcaster, when they do a cantrip, the cantrips are unlimited time. So they will actually be able to do something that's vi viable. Now... When you cast a cantrip, t take that 1d10, and you add your charisma, I think this is just straight off the rip. You add your charisma bonus to the damage. Now, that's, that's just regular cantrip. So you're doing 1d10. You should have a plus five. Oh, the, that's later level. I think the highest you can get uh, first level is uh, plus four as in a 19 I don't know if that's 
before or after races it might be before the races so you might be able to get it but i'm just gonna say 1d10 plus 4 damage eldritch blast is different eldritch blast is when you cast the spell as it gets stronger you add your you create another blast so you do one blast at first level fifth level you do two blasts i think the 11th level you do three blasts so at second level you get two eldritch blasts now look at it at fifth level for firebolt you're doing 2d10 damage plus your modifier but if you're a warlock you do two eldritch blasts that's doing 1d10 each and if you get agonizing blast you'll get plus five well no i'm thinking if you have a 20 in your score you'll get your charisma bonus to each blast so now you're doing 1d10 plus 5 1d10 plus 5 i'm assuming you have a plus 5 at level 5 so you are able to do those two things so you get those two blasts so that's it's already more damage assuming that you hit and which you should hit now again with fifth edition they made the magical items less necessary so you can play without them and i don't like how they did the trend which is uh they did this trend which is kind of annoying where they implemented where you can fight a ghost and instead of giving it damage immunity to non-magical weapons, it's just basically resistance. So it's just halving the damage. I'm thinking 5th edition did that. I'll have to... Do I have my book on me? No. It's in my crate. Or it might have been Pathfinder 2nd edition. One of them did it. One of them did it where now you can fight this ghost with a non-magical weapon and do damage to it. I understand video game wise. Okay, okay, okay. You want to allow them to fight everything. You don't want them to be limited, blah, blah, blah. You want it to be magical resources to be scarce and all this stuff. You can't have everything. You can't have everything. You want them to fight this ghost. They will either have to be spellcasters or they need a magic weapon. A group of fighters with no magic weapon will never in their life be able to fight a ghost. This is the most realistic thing. If you turn to a video game, then it's just, oh, yes, I can fight them now. And you just, there's no challenge. There's no understanding that they don't learn that you can go through life not being able to do everything to accomplish everything sometimes you're just not able not everyone's able but anyway so that's the great thing why i want a warlock in a party warlock amazing now i need to think when i play solasta i don't think they added a warlock i have to think i might make four all new characters and put them in the world we'll see we'll get to that point shadow heart loyal warrior a loyal cleric of shard I always need a cleric shadow heart is the sole survivor of holy mission undertaken on the mistress of the knight's behest she alone must deliver a relic of immense power to her coven in Bowder's gate while threatened by a strange new magic that is burgeoning from within yeah i'm gonna have to make new characters because uh Erlis is a uh, divine hound that's the thing it's a type of inquisitor but the only issue with that is there's no equivalent to fifth edition so instead of like saying uh, try to tweak them a little bit not gonna do it i make new characters gotta uh, with the last uh, since you only can have a party of four same thing with Baldur's gate three max party of four that's why i like path of uh pathfinder wrath of the righteous and kingmaker they give you you can have up to six which is nice now so i'm gonna need the four core i need one cleric one fighter type character i've heard that the bestest paladin is the extra healing and can pretty much 
take the place of a fighter. I'm going to add my sorcerer instead of wizard because I hate prepared spellcasters. And fifth edition is kind of all right because we'll see. I'll experiment. And then you need your rogue. But nice that she use a cleric. And this one, this guy's exciting. Okay, let's look. I probably shouldn't make this, but, or probably shouldn't say it, but it's just obvious. You get the, I know this person's a different race, but this one, th she's not human. So you don't get the relationship, but it's nice to see more diversity and inclusion and all that BS. But anyway, it's nice to see this guy and he has a lovely demon. So I'm surprised that this guy is not a warlock. But to become a living legend, he struck a bargain. What is he? Oh, he is a warlock. Oh, it has the name right there. A cleric. She's not a warlock. Was I making that entire conversation? Look at me. I thought I read that she was a warlock. Oh, she's just a regular fighter? Oh my gosh, mistake made. I'm going to leave this in here. That way, all of you can laugh at my mistake. She is not a warlock. I must have, because I looked at this before, I must have been looking at this one thinking he's a warlock. No wonder. I was surprised for no reason. Okay, that's nice. Available now. You can get the collector's edition if you want to. I do want to go over this video. Watch it with all of you. It's party time because I haven't seen this video. Hopefully it's good. I'll tell you a story, true soul. Can I boss? Okay. I just wanted to pause at this because I don't know if any of you played Dragon Age 2 close to the beginning of the game or a little bit after I think a little bit after like after you do the first part I believe the first part you open it up in a battle fighting demons and stuff like that and then after that then Barris, I think that's his name, starts telling you a story of the hero, and then that's your character. So when I listened to that, I was just reminded of Dragon Age. I need to get ready, um, check out Dragon Age Inquisition, and play that in pre preparation for Dragon Age 4. Life was dismantled piece by piece. And when I tried to buy it back, it cost me everything. I must finish what I started. Death's design will be complete. Discover Gatherick's secret. Find out what it is that makes him invincible so we can strip him of his advantage. Okay. Ah, oh, I didn't. Probably I, I need to have my hands on there. Okay, custom. You can try all this now because it's an early access. I'm still thinking about when we, I get closer to the release of the game to play it and go through it just a little bit. I haven't seen a lot of, I actually have. I've seen a lot of people talking about it. But as far as like actual gameplay like Snap Snap, I don't. I can't remember off the top of my head, so I don't know if, because you can play it, it's an early access. I'm assuming that you would be able to record and put the videos on YouTube. I'll have to see. But you can create a custom hero from what I see. So I don't have to have the companions if I don't want to. Because they could all be trash. But it's not like with Pathfinder where you have all this choice. And plus this is their first time making a 5th edition game. I know Larian Studios is used to making all the role playing games. Because come on they're not even going to have max level 20. Hopefully they go back on that and like change their minds. And do to max level 20. Because they can do it. They can do it. They can leave out the wish spell. I'd rather, I'd rather you... Well, if you don't make it to actually, you can get to levels if because that was one of the reasons I read, which is a bad reason because you get wish at level or you can get it at level 17. 
because level 17 is when you get a ninth level spell so if you take that out if that's one of your reasons you have to go up to level 16 that will have to be the max level which is kind of a letdown so i hope they change that That's looking good. And I, I do love the graphics so much. I, I'm, I'm really, probably right after Wrath of the Righteous, I probably will play this. Because this is just drawing my attention. And, or I might play Celasta, depending on when I finish Wrath of the Righteous. The first time, because I do have to play as Azric. I don't know, I might show Azric on the channel. I find out if people want to see it. And I, or I just if they don't want to see it, I'll probably play it outside of it during some days just to see how it they change with the story. So that's something to look at. You're a pawn, a slave. To... Displacer shape on Lamore, Lenore. Hmm, I don't know what that means. Was that a spell? I'm not. Oh, okay, I see the displacer beast. Oh, what are these man. special abilities? But you have something he doesn't. Allies worth having. Together, we will strike down the absolute. When you actually have verticality in the game, I don't know why they didn't change that. Alcat game. I don't know why they didn't add vertical, actual verticality, when they did Wrath of the Righteous, because. I think that would be something important, but I'm not going to criticize. Well, I'm going to criticize them on that because you have to be criticized, but I'm not going to hold it too much against them because what they did over other D and D video games that I've seen, uh, really it's based off of Pathfinder, but Pathfinder is not as well known as D and D. So they don't really have that many other Pathfinder type video games. If you know what I mean? that they really i love the overlay between things kingmaker you have the background your character is the ruler of a kingdom so they're running the kingdom while they're adventuring they're just not adventuring 24 7 365 days just like when i was playing as the commander like i was resting sometimes because now i'm doing the crusade stuff i'm managing the crusade so I can skip some days now since I have a lot of quests I'm not going to skip any days I don't know when any of this stuff is going to pop off so I just need to be ready but I like having those other more tactical uh probably it's not the strategic things for the crusade crusade, crusade management is really not strategic but whatever it's nice a nice little overlay system and they lost the rights to do Pathfinder, so they didn't. I don't know. They might get it again. They might get rights for D and D. If they get rights for D and D, then I'm be curious. Like, what type of game will they make? And even if they do get the rights, it's like you're coming after Baldur's Gate three, Baldur's Gate three, and I'm like, it's already looking like a very amazing game in term of graphics voice acting cinematics i need to look up to see if how big larry and studio probably we can do that oh we'll come back to the video this is important stuff now larry and studios size Headquarters get number of locations six. Number of employees they have four hundred plus. Okay, so this was founded in nineteen ninety six. Owlcat Games size. Okay, we need to figure out when was this created. What size is Owlcat? <sighs> More about us. Because these are my two favorite RP. Well, the well, they're not the only ones, and technically they're not my favorite because you have Bethesda Studio. They merged with Microsoft. We'll see. Okay, 2016, they were founded. 120 plus talented people. Okay, Larian Studios is older, so 
That's understandable. Outcat Games is the baby. Founded in 2016. Just a top. Wait, four years. Wait, that's seven. Okay. Seven years. We're in 2023. So they're, they're not toddlers. They're not babies. They're still pupubescent children. So I think I think we, they have some time. They get they get some slack. They haven't grown up yet. But when they grow up, I expect 20, 27, wait, what's seven years, 2023. When do people get old enough to do anything important? Is it seven, 11? What's the young, youngest? I don't know. But anyway, I'm expecting whenever they get to the preteens last teens, they need to get their life together. So, yeah, probably not. Until they grow up a little bit coming after the Dungeons and Dragons universe. Branching out to other universes is probably the safe bet. And finding their niche too. Which is understandable. And then tackling other game worlds is good for everyone. It's good for competition. Good for gamers. Because they get what they want in terms of seeing games that they played in some other area now done in this entirely different way so i'm excited to see what they do next i know Roll trader isn't even out yet but they go from pathfinder to warhammer 40k i don't know what maybe shadow run i know that's a tabletop rpg i have no idea but we'll see let's continue verticality amazing and i they should have the fly spell because I don't I know in Solasta you can actually cast the fly spell and move as if you're flying, which I think was cool. What is oh, yeah, that's the oh, clerics can channel energy, right? I was like, I can play around with the little systems because I know when this is fifth edition, right. Oh, I'm thinking Pathfinder 2nd, because in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, you have the heal spell. I do like the way they did the little actions with the heal spell in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, where if you do a 1 action heal, you only get like a 1d8. If you use a 2 action heal, you get the 1d8 plus 8 in terms of healing. And then if you do the 3 action, you get a burst heal to everyone, which I love that they did. They really did well with the action system on that and then you're able to condense so now you don't need all these many different type of spells well you're still limited on the spells that you can know because with the sorcerer at least i think the wizard you still have the spell book but with sorcerer at least uh you get a spell when you get a spell slot so the max spell size is four so Per level, you're only going to know a maximum of four spells for a sorcerer. Uh, I guess that's still more than 5th edition because 5th edition as a sorcerer, you're limited to 15 spells known at 20th level, which I thought, oh, that's super stupidity. Why would they do something like that? Well, with Pathfinder 2nd edition, you'll still get 36 spells. If you count four spells per level, and that's not including cantrip. So, oh, and you have 10th level spells too. They did add that. That's something interesting. I have to look into all of that. Bow before me. Bow before okay. Uh, is that the final boss or like a mid-tier boss that you'll fight at 10th level, I guess? I'm guessing. But anyway, thanks for watching. I didn't expect this to be that long. I just talk uh, whenever I... I just took these small things. A little bit about Starfield, Age of Wonders 4 because I loved it. And then we went into Baldur's Bal Gate 3. And Baldur's Gate 3 gets me excited. I've just... I won't say just, but I've recently recorded the uh, latest video, or not the latest. By the time you see it, it will be, I don't know when it will come out. But anyway, 
just playing the role playing games just bring back so many good memories like that's why i love rpgs you'll get to pretty much be whatever you want tell your own story play the game you want want to play uh have a lot of choice play your choice is important and you can have fun uh you can feel the motions of being all powerful sometimes you'll feel the emotions of being utterly weak and you just have to go back and cry like when you fight a dragon and your party's not buffed up and they breathe fire and then everyone dies very sad but don't enter the combat without being buffed i do like the fact that fifth edition decided to address the fact of buff rounds because it's like walking you walk around and suddenly something happens you're not buffed you're just you're just dead out of nowhere you didn't have a chance um i like the fact that with mage armor mage armor lasts an hour per level so it starts off long term i do like the fact with part of them addressing that is making everything increase with your level oh if this is not fifth edition pathfinder second edition did this by making they took the fifth edition route and they reduced the bonuses that magic items provided and but they made everything level up as you level up so basically every time you gain a level your armor class increases by at least plus one because you add your level to armor class attack bonuses uh save dcs pretty much everything with fifth edition they you add your level your Depending on the level, you get a proficiency bonus and you use your proficiency bonus. You add that to different skills. I kind of like the idea of the skill ranks because that's more precision and creating your character. I want to keep that there. Proficiency bonus is nice, but it's not as detailed enough. So you kind of slightly limit you can still make the character you want but you can't like it's just a little nibble off the fact that it's not as as realistic like you don't suddenly oh you can become a proficient in this skill by you just every you just suddenly level up and now you're as proficient as this other person who's been spending the entire campaign or the entire five years using a per learning how to talk i'll just say something like that versus when you have skill points you can say okay now i want to be good at art not archery because that's not a skill now i want to be good at acrobatics so let me start putting skill points in acrobatics so now it's more realistic uh so because your skill points this kind of reflects uh your ability to learn something new so of course you get more skill points you can learn this faster than someone who has less skill points something like that uh, of course you can change that definition because mm, i'm not going to get into that this already too long but there's a lot of things that need, need to be changed some things that can be made better one of the big things is implementing spell points because i do like the fact that in when you're playing a video game the typical video game when you're a magic user they have a mana pool and stuff like that and then you can just cast whatever you want i understand how people somehow they look at it objectively and they're like, like, okay, so I run out of first level spells that I can cast, but I still have magic power to cast this ninth level spell. So it kind of doesn't make sense to me. But then you have on the other side, if we give them spell pools, they'll just play the game and spend their spell points on these nine level spell so now they have six uses of a ninth level spell instead of two uses or something like that but i think you can keep the spell point system and just say hey it makes sense so instead of having the spell slots you get spell points equal to the spell size there'll be something to think about and implement instead of doing spell slots so now 
it just represents these spell points represent your magical your magical limit your magical pool and you can just use them for whatever spell slot you want that will that will be interesting then if you're playing a if you're creating a system where they have prepared spellcasters like a wizard then you can still have what spells they prepare but it just changes the thing like that you could do you can still do that or you could just have both you have spell slots okay and use your spell slots to represent okay this is the spell i prepared versus not being able to prepare the spells we'll see and well yeah you can treat them just like spell slots you can just make a cor corresponding thing i know in one of the books they wrote like a spell conversion system like if you were using the spell point rule I'm pretty sure it's in Pathfinder because Pathfinder since it was built on the open game license they just like fleshed out all the rules and stuff like that so there's going to be a great way resource to use whenever I start working on this in full but anyway thanks for watching this was a wonderful time i've enjoyed talking about role-playing games if you enjoyed it hit a like subscribe in the comments let me know what you think about Baldur's gate 3 what do you think about edge of wonders 4 that's still a role-playing game it's not a tabletop rpg but it's role-playing strategy really nice too what do you think about starfield it's not going to be fantasy but it's role-playing rpg shooter and what do you think about this world that I was talking about? What do you think about the tabletop versions of Pathfinder, Dungeons Dragons 5th Edition, or Warhammer 40k, or what other RPG system that you're playing? But anyway, have a nice day.